biggest one in the, in the flag. When the French uh, abolish monarchy, uh, the use of those uh, uh, decorated uh, flag uh, was not restricted to the royals anymore, so everybody, normal people, will start to use them and, uh, um, as war decoration in their own houses and flags. And then exactly the same happened at the beginning of the, 19th century, of the uh, 1990s. Uh, the production of the flag was became entirely, what I would say, 90% reserved for the art market. Next. This is uh, an image of one of those uh, umbrellas, the great umbrella under which the king uh, will be uh, processing. And uh, next. And this is a, a flag of a Gede priest in uh, Africa. And we can see, this is not a very late photo, and you can see they are still using the umbrella in a very similar ways to give power and authority of the people underneath the umbrella. Of course, it protects from the sun and all that, but this is mostly <laughs> for the power. So, it seems obvious that there are some sort of, uh, as we will see, in terms of function and dimension, there are some connection with the, the uh, voodoo flag of uh, Haiti. Voodoo flag also called Trapeau Voodoo. Uh, but a lot of the artistic skill had been lost because after six weeks' journey tied up in the holds of slave ship with uh, no personal possession, no sun, and little food and water, maybe there were some flag makers amongst those people, maybe there were some artists, but it's true that upon arrival in Haiti, there was not much uh, possibility for artistic expression. The only, um, the only uh, form of art that we know at that time uh, is the use of fetishes, which were like small figures in wood and, uh, or stone, which had some sort of magical power. But apart from that, all this kind of beautiful production was, it seems, to have, uh, to have lost. So, um, I have to look somewhere else to find some sort of uh, origin for the drapeau voodoo of Haiti. And I'm going to look at now uh, three other possibilities. First of all, the French Napoleonic military flags, then the um, Masonic aprons and flags, and also the flags of the uh, Brazilian samba schools. And we will see how images and symbols that seem completely unrelated uh, at first glance, uh, they actually uh, beautifully stitched together in a clarity of thought. Next. So, armies have long used uh, uh, um, symbols connected to saints and gods in order to assert their divine patronage, and this is also true of uh, uh, um, Haiti and Vodou. Uh, at the time, uh, before the Haitian Revolution, it was a French, Haiti was a, a French colony, and uh, the um, Napoleonic army were using three different kinds of flags. The infantry will have larger rectangular flags, and the cavalry will have uh, other swallowtail flags or um, square flags, like those ones, uh, the smaller square size. And the size is uh, functional because if you're riding a horse, you, it's better to have a smaller flag, and if you're displaying a flag inside the temple, it's, it's easier if it's smaller, but also because of the cost of the material and the availability of the material, it explains maybe the, the uh, smaller size of Drapeau Voodoo. Um, next. The correlation between the design of colonial French military flags and the uh, drapeau voodoo can be outstanding. Now, this background motif using regimental colonial Napoleonic Brigade is very similar to what we can find in voodoo flags. And this is one example of a, a, a drapeau voodoo. This is a, a flag for uh, the god Dambala and Aida Wedo. And as we can see, all these border, this geometrical border all around the flag, is very similar in design to one of those used by, uh, by uh, Napoleonic army. 
Uh, next. <laughs> Likewise, uh, the, one of the uh, non-official uh, symbols of France, together with the Marianne, is the coq gaulois. And uh, this is uh, in the center of uh, a French flag. And uh, the same symbol, the coq, is being transformed into coq qualité, the quality coq. And is the, <laughs> is, the symbol, is the symbol here used in a flag uh, for the um, political uh, movement of the ex-president Aristide. So when the President Aristide decided to start a political movement, he decided to use the uh, cock very similar to um, French Napoleonic flags. And one can only marvel at the irony of the symbolic conjunction. Um, and if, if you can see so many similarities in terms of design, but also in terms of function. Now, military flags are used during military ceremony uh, to salute and honor members um, of the army. So even nowadays, you will either raise the flag or dip the flag in order to salute, um, salute uh, an officer or a general. And this uh, um, procedure was taken by also by the Haitian army after the revolution, so much so that saluting with the, with the flags uh, during the reign of uh, the reign, during the presidency of uh, Christophe uh, at the beginning of the 19th century, the salute with the flag was reserved only to the king and the queen. And we will see how in the voodoo ritual we have similarly saluting of uh, saluting of uh, different members of the congregation with the, the flags. Next. Now, by the time of the Haitian Revolution, there were already several Masonic lodges who were catering for uh, uh, all the French colonies. And uh, um, uh, the idea of mystical fraternity also appealed to Haitians whose ancestors had developed their own secret society in uh, Africa. After the independence, a great number of Haitians decided to join uh, Masonic lodges and to use the symbolism connected with Freemasonry. So things like uh, the skull and bones, the all-seeing eyes, the pyramid, the compass and the square, uh, the G, uh, all those symbols we actually will see uh, they are actually included in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in voodoo flags. For example, here, this is another, another flag, and we can see the Masonic G is upside down, but um, it's been used again here. So, next. And lastly, I would like to look at the uh, Samba school, because uh, in Brazil, every Samba school has uh, a flag, and the flag is carried by the Porta Bandeira, she who carries the flag, and uh, during the procession, she leads the uh, Samba school, and she's accompanied by another figure, which is the Mester Sala, who dance all around her and bring the focus and the attention to the flag. And the Porta Bandeira herself, doesn't dance samba, she has a different set of movement and uh, during the parade she's, uh, she's evaluated by some judges. And this uh, um, uh, kind of movement and the presence of a female with a, female, uh, with a, with a male um, is very similar to what we're going to find after in the ritual, in the um, voodoo ritual. Next. Although uh, the historical um, evidence is scant, we know, I love this photo, uh, <laughs> we, we know that uh, originally Drapeau Voodoo were not at all as we see them, as I'm showing them to you now, but they were very simple. They were just uh, some uh, one or two different color fabric, and uh, they would have, of course, a place for, the, um, uh, for a, uh, a piece of wood, but it would be uh, little or no decoration. Sometimes it would be a piece, of, a piece of glass or a piece of metal attached to it, but it was very, very simple. So how or when uh, Drapeau 
Urdu became visually as we know them today. And it's all thanks to two men. Next. Um, the first one is this gentleman, Sius Tibu San Luis, who was a priest and he, was, he had the, one of the biggest congregation, the, one of the biggest uh, uh, voodoo uh, family, voodoo society in, uh, in Haiti. By voodoo society, I mean a group of people, it could, it, could, it could include a full village or a full neighborhood in a city, and all those people would gravitate towards the same temple, the same uh, and he was the main priest in this temple. He was also the leader of the biggest Rara, Rara band. Now, Rara is a group of musicians, but not only, who will uh, parade and perform around countryside and around the, uh, the city in the period between the end of Carnival and Easter Lent. Now, um, because this is the period where the temple, the activity of the temple gets really quiet and uh, the only activity is the Rara, the Rara bands who goes around and they, they dance and they play music and they're a mix between a carnival parade and a religious parade also with some political uh, overtone and uh, Sius had, was the leader of the biggest Rara band. Next. The other, the other responsible, the other person responsible for the creation of modern day Kapo Vudu is, is our brother Joseph Fortin, and uh, he was responsible because in 1940, 1940, there was a visiting uh, samba school coming for the carnival in Port-au-Prince. Now, sequins were used sometimes for, uh, for costume, but because they were metal sequins, they will often cut the fabric. Now when the Samba school came, uh, Fortin saw that they were actually all their costumes were made of plastic sequins, and uh, that helped to create uh, all sorts of uh, rara costume for the biggest rara band, which belongs to, well, which um, led by his uh, uh, brother. So next, those are the costumes of uh, um, Rara and member. Um, so what happened next is that uh, a neighboring um, uh, a mambo, a priestess from a neighboring temple, asked for team to create a voodoo flag for the god Dambala and uh, Fortin, because he knew how to use the sequence for those costumes, um, decided to use the same material for the flags. So, how do we make a voodoo flag? A voodoo flag is a complex process and is not very uh, dissimilar from creating a um, stained glass window. You will have uh, the main responsible, the main artist, will create a design and then he will uh, uh, ask for the assistant to carry, out the, to carry out the work. And so at the beginning you need to have a, a very strong piece of fabric which would be uh, stretched on a frame and then placed on an open top table so you will have access from underneath and from, from above. So for example, this has been stretched, that's the back, and then it will just place, be placed like this on the, on, the, on the table so the person could go from underneath up and down. You can see the back is quite nice. Very tidy. <laughs> Very tidy, yeah. Uh, the design could have been created before or after being stretched on the frame. And at the end, you will put a um, backing material, usually satin. Next. Next. So this is the five phases. That is the hands with the uh, needle and the thread from underneath. Next. Going through, going through the uh, sequence. Then it has to go through a bead. Next. And then it goes back in the sequence. And then 
underneath, and that locks the sequin onto the fabric.